Hello again. I'm Carson Hawley, the president of the Oregon and Southwest Washington chapter and head of business development at Westland Investors in Portland, Oregon. Welcome to today's webinar, Commercial Real Estate Opportunities in Region 1, the Resurgence of Secondary Markets. We're happy to share this webinar with everyone in the industry today. For CCIM members, this is just one of the many benefits that are designed to help you adapt and thrive in 2021 and beyond. Joining us today is CCIM Chief Economist Casey Conway, CCIM, CRE, and MAI. He's going to discuss the factors that are bringing secondary markets and Zoom towns back to the forefront, including the current trends, what's driving them, and how you can best set yourself up to tap into the commercial real estate opportunities in our region. Please feel free to ask questions throughout using the Q&A tab. We'll be answering as many as we can at the end of the discussion. And if you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please use the chat feature to ask for help with that. The recording and accompanying presentation will be emailed to all registered attendees. Casey, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. I'll turn the show over to you. All right, so we'll jump in there. It's so great uh, to be with everybody and to start this uh, regional uh, series, and especially on the Pacific Northwest. I'm here in the Southeast in North Carolina today. So um, really, really looking forward to this and hopefully giving you guys a bunch of new, unique insights to your particular region. So I want to start maybe where we left off uh, from our um, you know, earlier uh, presentation um, beginning of the year, back in January, when we had the, uh, you know, the, the annual migration reports coming out from the different van uh, line companies. So I think it's an important starting point that we're going to pivot from. So many of you remember the U-Haul migration report. There was also the United Van Line. So here's the United Van Lines. And in your region, Idaho was number one and Oregon was number three from the most net uh, in, inbound my, migration moves into your state. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about why that happened at the bottom there. I have an arrow pointing out to um, over 40% of Americans moved in 2020 for believe it or not, a new job. And I think that number is gonna be even higher here in 2021. And then 27% moved to get closer to family because they probably doubled up during COVID. So that was then beginning of the year, here's now. Subsequently, we received some of the um, 2020 census information on migration. And so I've got circled in two red circles in the upper left corner, how your region is compared. Um, so you can see uh, Utah's just outside of your region, but you may adopt them. <laughs> region two may object, but um, Nevada, um, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, uh, and even Montana, almost at 10%. In the Pacific Northwest, people don't generally think of these kinds of population migration numbers um, like they do, particularly in the South or Southeast. We get the media gets Texas and Florida and the, and the key Southeastern states. So um, this is pretty, um, pretty important. And it brings together that the U-Haul and United Van Lines uh, migration reports aren't too far off. Maybe we'll leave the, the next uh, decennial uh, census uh, to them. So those are pretty good numbers. There's another item I wanna bring to your attention, a new piece of information we haven't talked about before. It's ALEC. Uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council. And so they look at economic outlook ratings. They do an analysis. They just came out with their one for 2021, looking at 2020 data. And they look at um, those particular states that are most likely uh, from their outlook uh, to have more economic development. And generally their thesis is that states that spend less um, and tax less tend to experience higher growth rates. Um, so again, it's not generally something people think of in the West Coast and less taxes and less spending, um, but you can see Idaho in particular almost made the top 10 ranking. Um, and then Montana, uh, you know, you were, you know, at least in the top 35, but Washington and Oregon, not so much. Um, so this is their outlook on where they think who's going to have the strongest growth. And the reason I point this out is if you're doing site selection work or you're working with companies, particularly coming out of COVID, they are looking at this type of data. So it's kind of triangulating all these pieces together. The next one that they're looking at, and this is an important one, and you actually, um, in your region compares very well here. Uh, Tax Foundation is one of my favorite uh, sources that I look at. And they just did an analysis on states and funding their pension plans. And so in particular in your region, 
you have uh, states that are doing very well in terms of the uh, funding their pension liabilities. Sorry about that. Uh, in particular, in Idaho, over 90% of your public pensions are fully funded. Now contrast that with, say, we'll pick on, on Larry sitting there in Chicago uh, and in the Illinois region, where it's obviously much, much less than that, under 40%. So in your particular region, uh, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho lead in terms of uh, very well-funded pension um, plans. Companies look at this. Uh, businesses look at this. Uh, nobody wants a pension benefit um, kind of bailout or be in that candidate. So this is another area that's very strong for your region that most people around the country wouldn't wouldn't put into that bucket or naturally think of in that light like they maybe would, you know, Texas or Florida. So next, I want to pivot a little more granular here. And so many of you have heard me speak before know of my um, how much I like site selection and site selection magazine. They do an annual state of the states. So I pulled each of your states here in your region, and I'm gonna start with Montana and look at what you do really well. Uh, this is a very well-respected non-political analysis done by Site Selection Magazine. If you don't subscribe, I really encourage you to because it's, it's about a hundred bucks a year, but they, they capture everything that's going on from site selection, economic development, and competitions for site selection around the country. So. Let's look at the two things that Montana really ranks strong in. So they rank fifth in two categories in the top five. And the first one is um, their overall um, business um, climate environment. And the second one is your fiscal health. So um, Montana doing very well managing their fiscal issues. In fact, Montana actually has a budget surplus uh, so far in 2021 coming out of COVID. And as a, a business climate environment, it's very well in a minute, I'm gonna talk about why that's um, kind of pretty important to have that foundation. And that foundation is Montana's broadband opportunity. So those of you on the call from, um, from Montana know that in May, your governor signed into effect a bill that piggybacked off on the funding from the, from the CARES bill in the COVID um, relief bill uh, to expand broadband connectivity. And so Montana is gonna get broadband uh, really across the state and this is very important because believe it or not, Montana was just ranked by a number of the leisure and travel uh, companies and analysts, uh, the number one place that people from the Northeast are going this summer, uh, post COVID in their travel. So we all know it's a great fly fishing, great outdoor state, um, wonderful place to, to go visit, but maybe your Wi-Fi wouldn't work so well there. So if Montana, given its proximity to Idaho and seeing the the migration that's coming out of Washington and California into Idaho, uh, that Montana could be a big beneficiary. I think this is a huge opportunity um, for Montana and particularly the commercial real estate is if you have broader, more uh, statewide um, broadband, um, that's really gonna be accretive to the commercial real estate assets and, and whatnot. So this is what I think is one of the big opportunities that's ahead for Montana and a story for CCIMs to get out to your clients, particularly those out of state, and even national tenants that lease space or operate in Montana. Let's look at Idaho. So Idaho is a little bit of a, an oxymoron here. So it ranks number seven in terms of being one of the, um, in terms of um, uh, fiscal health and really having a relatively low, low cost of uh, power generation, but it ranks 50th, the bottom for workforce readiness. What, what the heck, if everybody's moving to Idaho and it's number one in the United Van Lines migration, why is it getting such a low rank on um, workforce readiness? And the answer is Idaho is importing a lot of the skilled workforce. So you, although you're not organically creating it, you only get credit in this uh, site selection study if you're organically creating that workforce readiness. And so with people migrating in, I would take this ranking with a grain of salt and, and don't have it used negatively against you um, because really you are drawing a lot of workforce that's coming out of more expensive locations, uh, Seattle, San Francisco, um, and, and whatnot. Here's another validation at that point. So when we look at where manufacturing is strongest and where it's occurring the most across the country, we naturally think of the Southeast, we think of Texas, but how many realize that Idaho and Utah are becoming major manufacturing powerhouses in the country. 
In fact, they rank in the, in the top 10. Idaho is now in the top 10. And a lot of reasons are here. It's a good fiscal business climate. Pension funds are well uh, funded. And you're able to draw workforce that you can't get in from places like Washington State. And Oregon is another big draw that you're drawing out of in California. This is not unlike what's happened in the last decade in South Carolina. South Carolina didn't generate organically a, not, a lot of the skilled workforce it needed, particularly for Boeing uh, to, to build and develop its um, uh, Boeing manufacturing in South Carolina. Uh, but, but it's become one of the top two manufacturing states because it imported. It drew in a lot of the skilled workforce from, say, Florida with all of the, when the space shuttle program was uh, decommissioned. Uh, in the Space Coast, they drew a lot of that skilled aeronautical engineering workforce into South Carolina. So uh, this is an important part of the Idaho story. More manufacturing is coming to Idaho. Uh, you're becoming well recognized in that category. Uh, Idaho, Utah, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, Arizona in this area. So here's where uh, some of that comes into play. Look for Idaho to compete for electric vehicle manufacturing. So up until recently, most of the major EV uh, manufacturing announcements have gone into Tennessee, Alabama, South Carolina. Um, but um, Arizona recently set that, uh, this, uh, disturbed that apple cart. So what I have here is a slide on Hyundai. Hyundai recently announced that it is moving all of its supply chain and manufacturing um, essentially to the United States. It is done with trying to have supply chain manufacturing outside of the United States, and it's moving it here. They're planning on investing over $7 billion between now and 2025 to make it the number one EV manufacturer in the world. They want to have a number one market share at over 10%. And right now, they have major plants in Georgia, south of Atlanta, a place called West Point, and in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And they're building a massive electric battery plant north of Atlanta. But they're concerned about too much auto concentration in the Southeast and in Texas with Tesla. And so they're looking at alternative locations to diversify that risk. And here's one, this was a big needle move um, for the electric vehicle manufacturing. Phoenix just beat out Nashville for a Canadian based EV auto manufacturer. Some of you may know them. This is one, if you don't know, um, and I'll mispronounce <laughs> their name, but Electra Mechanica, um, but it's, it's a not totally utilitarian one person electric vehicle, but they've got other models they're getting ready to introduce. They like the Pacific Northwest. They like the engineering and skill workforce out of Seattle uh, and Northern California. They love the Idaho uh, market. Um, Montana be giving more broadband can bring more of this into place. And you don't have this competition for this EV vehicle manufacturing occurring in your region of the country. So I think you're going to see more of this come your way. This is another opportunity, I think, primarily for uh, Idaho, but expanding. You could even see it in Washington State. And with Canada getting into the EV manufacturing, this is a unique opportunity that I think is going to expand further in your region. Let's talk about Washington State. So Washington ranks really high, obviously, in higher education, research, and development. Um, it's critical to the tech workforce and tech innovation. So that's excellent. And number three, you rank one of the lowest uh, or the best in terms of electric power generation. So when people ask me, why is there so much Bitcoin manufacturing going on in Washington state? It's because it takes a lot of electricity to do all of that mining. And it's relatively cheap in um, particular Washington state with all the rivers and hydroelectric uh, power generation that you have there. So that's not gonna change. So when you think about could Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining and a lot of this tech stuff that's heavy on electrical power usage, can it just pack up and leave? About the only place that it can do that um, is probably the Southeast um, in Tennessee, Alabama, uh, Georgia, where we've got um, Georgia Power, which is next uh, cheapest compared to your power generation. And then Texas, but if Texas doesn't upgrade and, mine, and maintain their, um, their grid system during cold weather and snowstorms, it might not be so attractive. So uh, this is a strength that Washington has. It's gonna continue, keep your tech workforce and tech industry very strong. 
So Oregon, so number six, you rank in terms of worker compensation claims. So when people do have issues and whatnot, uh, you have relatively few in Oregon. Uh, and number 15, you do pretty well as a business climate. I will tell you though, that outside of Oregon, the message you may not wanna hear is that Oregon really is facing some headwinds. After last year and the protests and the disruption and uh, all of the ESG um, protests and what happened, many businesses and whatnot around the country are very rattled about Portland and putting new businesses or expanding new businesses. So Portland in particular is probably going to continue to lose, uh, I think some business um, that's gonna go to Washington or inland uh, to Idaho and other places. So Oregon has really got to address how does it deal with what happened in 2020? How does it rebuild a, a sense of security and, and police and, and, and whatnot? Because right now, that is not the perception and perception is reality. So uh, um, I just throw that out there. Uh, Oregon, you have some headwinds in the perception about security and being a secure place to expand or locate a business. All right, the next one I wanna talk about that's a neat opportunity is housing. So we've been seeing, we hear all the stories about record home prices and rising rents. Um, and what we're seeing is workforce moving to affordable, what we call Zoom MSAs. The MSAs that have benefited from the Zoom kind of workforce that's resulted from COVID. So this is a neat site that I've been tracking and following called Rent Cafe in their blog. And they look at the 30 hottest rental markets in the country. And they've, they've gotta be hot if they've got workforce coming in or more remote work and economic activity. So look at in the top 11 in your region, uh, Spokane, um, look at uh, Boise, and we've talked about Idaho, Eugene, Oregon, um, and Tacoma. Um, Tacoma, an, an alternative to maybe the Seattle region and, and the cost of the Seattle. So you rank very high and doing very well on the multifamily, the hottest markets, lots of demand, lots of workforce migration. Um, and again, for those of us that reside maybe in the eastern part of the United States or outside the West Coast, we generally don't think about how strong and healthy and vital all of your markets are. So uh, use this uh, information to help um, you know, get, that, get that message out and elevate it. I do wanna talk in the same breath on housing and multifamily that once again, Freddie Mac has decided to extend multifamily forbearance programs. So now it's gonna run through the end of September. And the reason I bring this up is today is FOMC meeting day. It seems like every new federal open market committee meeting we have, uh, it's the most important ever. It'll be the chairman's most important one ever. The message is gonna be more important. Every single one of them seem to be that way because they can't make up their mind about what they're really doing in monetary policy. But I bring this to your attention because until we see all of these support measures come out of uh, really the COVID era, whether it's mortgage forbearance, rent forbearance, stimulus checks, all of these types of activities, are we really going to figure out, do we have an inflation problem? Do we really go from a boom economy that we have right now flat out into a recession? And so um, this is one of those support mechanisms that just keeps being extended. We used to think about it in CMBS when they would uh, you know, just kind of kick the can down the road and do interest only for shorter periods of time. This housing issue is one we're kicking the can down the road. So be aware, any of you that have clients that are multifamily, they need more. They may need more help on this issue. I fear that multifamily forbearance could become multifamily rent forgiveness. And I don't think we have a lot of multifamily property owners that are in that camp. I do think there'll be a means testing, might be something like 50,000 in income or less, your rent forbearance gets forgiven. So be aware that that's been expended. All right, so the next thing I wanna to pivot to is a little more macro. Um, and that is to look at kind of my report card. Six months ago, what was I telling you, the CCIMs and the CCIM Institute? And I had really three things at the end of the year, early January, when we last kind of spoke as a group, uh, what were the metrics that I were most following that would tell us what to expect in the second half of 2021? So the first one I said is, it's clearly gonna be about vaccination success. Think back to December and early January. We had just concluded, but we thought we had just concluded. I don't think they'll ever conclude the 2020 elections. We didn't know if we were gonna have a smooth transition to power. In Georgia, we had the special runoff elections to uh, you know, decide on two Senate seats, whether Biden would have the, um, you know, the votes in the Senate to do pretty much what, what he would like to in his agenda or not. Uh, he did get both of those Georgia Senate seats. Georgia is, is now arguably a blue state <laughs> um, on that side. 
but think of the cluster that we were facing in getting vaccination logistics done. And it didn't look very promising. And it looked like this thing could take all year and we would miss the opportunity that we're now seeing in, in 2021. But we turned that around collectively. I think it was a lot of entities rolling their sleeves up, not necessarily the politicians, but we, see, we, we attained success in vac vaccination. And as you can see on the left, uh, were the numbers back in December and January. So the, per the percentage of vaccinations that were actually getting administered, it was like in the 15 to 25% range. Now look at in your region, I just pulled this from Becker's the other day, in Washington state really doing well in, um, in leading on that front. Uh, you've got almost 90% of all of your vaccinations that you've received actually administered. Montana's doing well, Oregon's doing well, Idaho. Look at these ratios. Who would have thought honestly six months ago that the kind of bottom success states and vaccinations would be in the 77, 78 to 88% range success in vaccination. So you're, you're doing very well. You're seeing the benefits of that now with your economies opening up. Uh, California was one of the latest to do that. The second one I told you to watch was look at the TSA passenger count. So we went from flying two and a half million people a day to just uh, uh, you know, under you know, 100,000 in April of last year. We're back to over 2 million passengers a day. Um, traveling. And then the castle occupancy index that if you had vaccination success and we got people traveling, we would probably see office um, perform. So let's look at the TSA numbers here. On the left, this is what we were seeing in January of this year, only 30 to 40 percent of the pre-COVID traffic. And look at where we are on the right today, 2.1 million passengers uh, on June 13th here, the latest data I had when I put these slides together the other day. So we're seeing pretty consistently 1.718 to 2.1 million passengers. Our, our peak normal was 2.2 to 2.5. So I'm on my sixth travel trip on an airplane uh, in six weeks right now. Uh, the airports are jammed. Uh, you still do have to wear a mask. The seats are full. And I'll be honest with you, from four to six weeks ago when I flew to Miami, I could get an airline ticket for under $200 round trip from Atlanta to Miami. Uh, my trip up here to Raleigh, North Carolina yesterday through today was over $400. That fare had doubled in essentially three weeks. So the airlines are making up for those margins. We are traveling. It's more leisure than it is business. But at the hotels that I'm staying at, the parking lots are full. There's business travelers there. It's not just leisure travel. Not everybody's coming here for summer vacations in Wake Forest and Raleigh, uh, although it's a good place to vacation. Um, so this is a lot of business traveler. Um, so a lot of business people and people like me wearing uh, a suit. Here's the bad news. This is the office occupancy. So look back uh, to the beginning of the year, we were struggling with only less than one in four going back to the office. Castle is the entity that has the key cards that tracks our you know, entry and exit from office buildings. So they have all that data, they track it all over the country, not only for office, but industrial and retail as well. And look at where we are today, last week, um, we were at 29%. We still can't get 30% of our workforce back in the office. Now, some companies are trying to force that issue, but despite vaccination success, despite the airlines opening up and us being able to travel by air, we are not necessarily going back to the office. And so we'll talk a little bit about what's going to happen in the outlook there. So let's pick a company that you're familiar with in your region. So a company called Facebook it tends to get called before Congress about every six months <laughs> on something that they do wrong. Um, but Facebook in the last week or so announced that 50% of their combined workforce um, is, is going to be able to, um, what they believe, work remote. And they just, made, they just put out a communication uh, that stated, sorry about that, this thing's flicking around on me, that uh, even after the pandemic, uh, all employees can work remote. And they're going to provide accommodations for that. Um, but here's the catcher, and you guys need to pay attention to this in your region of the country because you do have some uh, more uh, high-cost markets to live in and work in. And that is, Facebook has said, if you move for remote work reasons to a lower-cost region, they're going to adjust your salary. So if I move, let's say, from Seattle to Montana, uh, say Helena, Helena Montana, uh, they're going to adjust my salary for doing that. I think there's going to be a lot of litigation around that because you should be paid based on your skill 
And I think there's going to be a lot of other allegations around that adjustment, uh, whether it's uniformly, whether it's discriminating against one demographic or population group. But you need to be aware that companies are looking to use this remote work uh, item as an ability to lower other costs, including wages. Um, the expectation by Facebook and many other tech companies and financial companies is that, uh, that um, their office uh, working workforce, that they expect them to be remote or doing some sort of alternative work arrangement 50% of the time. So I think that really tells us some, some things we need to be concerned about in terms of um, office going forward. Next thing is, uh, there are a couple of studies. This one was by Flex Jobs that I liked. It was pretty good. The methodology was good. They looked at what some of the statistics are telling us about the perceptions of office work. And so what I love about it is they looked at what employees versus employers are predicting. And from the employees, 28% of them have said they plan the minute things open up and job interviews occur, 28, almost you know, you know, a third, somewhere between a quarter and a third, they plan to get a new job that allows them to work remote. And on that, on the graphic on the left, the item that was the single largest response given on the question of what do you miss most about work in the office? The number one response was nothing. <laughs> 35% said, I don't miss a darn thing about working in the office. Um, they've gotta be people like me that are more baby boomers or maybe they're near the end of their career because the response that those that want more communication, more interaction, lunch, chit chat, in-person meetings, they tend to be the workforce that's under the age of 35. They realize that out of sight uh, is out of mind. And they know that the only way they're gonna get mentored and grow in their career is to actually be seen and heard in person. Employers, what they predict, this is pretty interesting. In the Gartner survey, they found that 74% of chief officers plan to permanently shift to at least 5% of their workforce to remote work. Now that doesn't sound like a big number, but you take 5% of the office workforce and say, I don't need offices for them anymore. And you translate that really to about 40 primary markets in the country, in those urban areas. Those are huge numbers. Those move office vacancy rates from you know, the 10 to 12% range to the 15 to 18% range in places like New York and San Francisco. 76% of the companies will continue to allow flexible work. This is as recently as the last 60 days, these, these um, surveys. And 43% of companies will continue with remote work period. And so that's gonna be fairly interesting to see how that plays out on the office side. This one was just done by The Economist. And it looked at things not just here in the US about office, but they looked at it globally. And they looked at things and they looked at the vacancy rates and the trends. And what we're experiencing with office work and it being more remote and, and, and being a systemic change, they're finding that exists the same across the world. It's, it's the same thing that's happening in Europe, maybe more so because Europe is, has had a, a longer battle with the, with the COVID virus. On the right there, they looked at the World Read Index. And what they found is that office is seeing almost the same kind of decline as retail. And so remember, retail was affected by the e-commerce economy, closing stores, ordering online and delivering to me. And office from this remote work is almost as devastating an impact on office as a property type as e-commerce and store closings have been on, on retail. So really be paying attention. I think you're gonna have a lot of office REIT type clients and entities that have assets in your region. Uh, Seattle in particular, you have a lot <laughs> of big office assets that are institutionally owned, that are held by REITs, and they're gonna be struggling to figure out what do, we, what do we do with these assets? What are they worth? What's the valuation? A lot of CCIM type skill set counseling. All right, I'm gonna pivot from office to logistics, and I thought this was a really good translation. So I'm a director, an independent director for a big public industrial REIT known as Monmouth. We own and uh, our landlords for big e-commerce warehouses to entities like FedEx and Amazon and Home Depot. Uh, we got embroiled in a hostile takeover action last December, and we went through a process to try to fight that, and we ended up with a really nice kind of savior, Sam Zell, with his EQ, EQC REITs. Some of you may know Sam as a, as a good CCIM, um, and so Sam has said, I'm pivoting completely from office as an asset completely to logistics. So he's in the process of completing the merger. We'll hope to complete by September of taking over our industrial REIT 
and he's been very public about he's going to dispose of all of his off his remaining office assets, which are in really good markets and really good office properties that are highly leased up in Austin and Denver and Washington, D.C. And he says, I just don't see the long term growth opportunity in office anymore like I see it in industrial and logistics. So I think that's a pretty good punctuation mark to pivot from office to logistics. I wanna to bring to your attention that we're pretty close. Uh, hopefully in the next uh, week or so, uh, we've been working with the CCM Institute and Larry uh, Guthrie and the communications team on a new insights paper. We didn't have one last year because of COVID. And the one that we've worked on here is last mile logistics and it covers everything. And so this is the cover, it's in the final phases of, of getting ready to be released, hopefully here within the next week, probably next week. So you're the first audience that we're sharing, get ready to look for this maybe next week. Uh, here's some of the topics in the, in the section categories. I've talked for a long time about the Golden Triangle, which is an area from the Great Lakes down to Texas and through the Southeast, which is capturing about 75 to 80% of all site selection and manufacturing and logistics expansion announcements. I talk a lot about in this paper, the voracious appetite for logistics assets. Cap rates continue to compress. Industrial and logistics is one of the few property types where we're continuing to see the cap rates compress. Uh, and, it, and that's not just for LA and Long Beach, it's for all the other markets. Um, so we're seeing in the Monmouth deal, the merger, uh, that deal when it's finally fully publicized, the cap rate for 120 assets that are all in secondary markets except for four, will command a cap rate south of 5%. That's what used to exclusively go to LA Long Beach. Um, we also did a story map. So the CCIM Institute knows we have the site to do business. We partner with Esri. Um, we have many of us are leading the way in kind of telling the interactive visual story about data. And so this is the first Insight Papers where uh, we, we did a, a story map to go with the uh, paper. And the other thing is we talk about how you know, trying to find speed and reliability and last mile logistics building off of the last mile um, logistics uh, course that we introduced back in January. So two great resources. This is coming. I encourage you to really look for it. It's a really fresh update. I think there'll be a lot of media interest. This might be something you might want to distribute to a number of your, of your clients. There's another big story in the logistics is playing out right now, and it affects your region in a big way. And this is the merger between Kansas City Southern and the Canadian National Rail. So Kansas City Southern was the only class one railroad that moved through the center of the country down into all of the major Mexico manufacturing and port markets. It really was a key crown jewel that created an intersection, a T intersection with Burlington Northern, Santa Fe, and Kansas City Southern or East, West, North, South intersection in the country. Well, Kansas City Southern, I've been warning for a couple of years, it was right for someone to, to, to merge with it. And so the Canadian railroads really realized this and Canadian Pacific, who many of you know, starts up in uh, Port Rupert in Vancouver and allows containers to come in from Asia and not pay a harbor maintenance tax on the containers. That's what has been affecting the Seattle and Tacoma ports in particular. It allows them to come into Canada and not pay that tax up to $1,000 on containers and drop them down into the center of the country into places like Chicago and then move it all the way down into the Gulf at the Port of Mobile. Well, that was who the original marriage partner was with Kansas City, it was with the uh, uh, Canadian Pacific Rail. That switched and went to Kansas City National, or yeah, Canada National. And so that's the middle map in there that has the red lines. That shows you the footprint of Canadian National. And you can see it spans all across Canada from west to east. It collects everything from potash and rare earth minerals and lumber, and things coming in from Asia, it's an incredibly valuable network of bringing very critical commodities down into the United States. And so whoever taps into that and then can bring it down into the Gulf is a big winner. Well, with a matching with Kansas City Southern, the Canadian National Network works to really bring all of that activity down into Houston, into Port Freeport. And so it means a loss for Port of Mobile and coming down into the Southeast, so I think what that means is Canadian Pacific is next gonna be in play for a merger. And my speculation is it would be a really neat matchup with um, a Norfolk Southern. So if you see the map in the upper right corner, it shows the seven class one railroads, the different colors, Canadian Pacific was in the red, uh, the purple color was Kansas City Southern. And then you can see Norfolk Southern in kind of the, um, in the turquoise there. 
So a lot is gonna be happening in the consolidation of logistics, particularly in rail, next in trucking, and then even in REITs. So this is something to pay attention to. It plays out in very important roles for your particular region and how goods from the Pacific Northwest and Northwest Canada or Southwest Canada come down into the United States and get into Mexico and get into manufacturing. So this is a big story, this uh, big logistics um, merger that's affecting your region. The other one that came out recently, we did a podcast on was the American Society of Civil Engineers quadrennial every four year uh, report card on America's infrastructure. The good news was for the first time in 20 years, we didn't get a failing D grade. We got upgraded to a C, but it was only because of ports and rail, which got a B grade. They brought the average up. The reason that's important is you all know that we're, we're embroiled in a new debate over infrastructure, an infrastructure piece of legislation or bill. And so the reason I point this out is you need to read this report and understand the infrastructure needs in your part of the, of the country. And in particular, we just had a, a report on the blue economy. Uh, we just did a podcast today that's going to come out that Larry uh, worked with me on. That's the marine economy. And it looked at how important the marine economy is to our overall GDP. And then with the American Society of Civil Engineers report, we can see that we have 173,000 miles of major highways that are in total disrepair. And we have over 45,000 bridges, which are primarily in port markets, Seattle, Tacoma, San Francisco, LA, um, and then on the East Coast, Savannah and Charleston and down into Florida. And we have um, thousands of bridges um, that need repair as well. And, but in the bill, they're only looking at tackling 10,000 of the 45,000 bridges that are at risk of collapse, not just needing a little paving and paint, uh, but they're in complete risk of collapse. And looking at only by providing physical funding for 20,000 miles of our 173,000 miles of roadways. I want you to be aware of it because as an industry, as goes infrastructure in your region, in your city, in your state, goes the health of your commercial real estate, particularly a lot of industrial. So pay attention on this debate. The other thing that's important to watch is it's in the red font there, is the Biden plan wants to just target major MSAs, New York and California in particular. And they wanna leave out many other states. Uh, believe it or not, Iowa has the, is the state with the most number of bridges at risk of complete collapse that are important to bridging our major inland uh, waterways and levees. And so we really need to pay attention to this as an industry as much as the 1031 exchange and make sure that we're getting the proper information to your local um, legislative officials to provide feedback into this funding. The next thing that's a big change to, to think about for your region in this where workforce has been migrating, where population has been going, in the inland nature of the Golden Triangle and manufacturing is that CBRE did this report that they released the end of last year. And for the first time ever, Atlanta surpassed LA, Long Beach, New York, uh, Washington State as the MSA with the most number of very large industrial transactions over a million square feet. And so we need to pay attention to where this logistics infrastructure is being built, where these big new e-commerce assets are, where the manufacturing is going. Um, this, is a, this is a concern and a trend that places like Seattle, and I think Portland, you need to pay attention to um, and where these are going in Idaho, Montana, uh, Utah, Salt Lake, get ready. You're gonna begin to see a lot, a lot more of these big assets coming in. So this is a big, a big change to keep an eye on. The other part of this that I think is important is looking at what I talked about are you ready for more site selection, particularly of electric vehicles? So I mentioned Idaho, and uh, particularly in the, the big win that um, Phoenix just had with the Canadian EV manufacturer. EV manufacturers are moving away from big markets. Many of these assets are moving into what's called the other LA, Lower Alabama is the joke when I was over at Alabama rather than Los Angeles. And so this is the Mercedes plant, the, the EV battery logistics facility that's being built for Mercedes for all of North America is being built near Tuscaloosa, Alabama, the University of Alabama. Uh, this is an asset that is going into Monmouth's portfolio before the merger. And when this deal was done, this could be the highest single rent per square foot e-commerce industrial warehouse that has hit the market in the United States. So think of not Seattle or San Francisco or LA, but a place in lower Alabama setting the record for low cap rate and highest rent per square foot. And so this, all this stuff is changing quite a bit and it's why 
really I encourage you when the new logistics uh, insights paper releases next week, we talk about a lot of this. So I think that more of this is in, in line coming particularly to Idaho. You guys should be ready for this stuff. If, if Phoenix can start to knock off Nashville, which has had Cadillac and Volkswagen and all the other major announcements, I think Idaho, uh, you can be a real contender. I provided here on this slide, some of the logistics and last mile resources. These are included at the end of the Ward Center's last mile logistics course that we introduced in January from the Institute. I wanna close here today on the Fed. So today is an FOMC meeting day. Um, they're meeting and having their press release while we're on this particular call. Um, and so I want you to be aware of a few things because the single greatest risk, I think in the second half of this year and going into next year is bad Fed monetary policy and interest rates and inflation. This chart shows what the Fed's balance sheet looked like when I was at the Fed in 2007, eight, nine and 10 after the Great Recession, and the balance sheet was only a trillion dollars. It has today grown to over $8 trillion. And remember that the Fed doesn't manufacture or sell anything. It just calls Treasury and says, print money. It's highly inflationary. There is a day of reckoning. And this kind of expansion in the balance sheet by the Fed is unprecedented. It wasn't like this during the Reagan administration or the 70s or any of our war periods. This is unprecedented growth in the balance sheet. So I put on the left, the remaining FOMC meetings for this year. These are all gonna be very important. They're gonna affect things like interest rates, cap rates, uh, pricing in commercial real estate. And so I'm in the camp that inflation is out of the genie bottle. This term that the Fed uses called transitory inflation is really code for, gosh, I sure hope we don't have systemic inflation that's gonna give us the 1970s again. I'm very worried we're headed in that direction. So here's what my view is on inflation. I figured I just would take these screenshots of CNBC the last couple of days. And so Jamie Dimon was on June 14th and he said, um, and he's a pretty smart guy in finance. He says, JP Morgan is hoarding cash because there's a very good chance inflation is here to stay. They don't know where to put the assets to work. Um, we do have, I think, systemic and structural inflation. The last time we had it was the 1970s, 1976, 77 to 81 where interest rates went from four or 5% range to the prime at 21% by 1981. And guess what the inflation rate was from 1977 to 81, it was 6%. Guess what it is today? Year over year, yesterday's producer price index, over 6%. The PPI taking out the volatile food and energy, almost 5%. On the right, the CPI year over year, we're at about 5%. It's in everything. And what I'm scratching my head at is how can we have five, six percent inflation and a 1.5 percent 10 year treasury? And the answer is the Fed is using its balance sheet, it's calling treasury and saying we have to buy the treasury bonds that are being put up for auction and we have to bid them down to a lower price of 1.5 percent yield because the rest of the market isn't buying them at that level. They're not showing up and buying the treasuries at that rate. So they're artificially trying to keep the rates down. And at some point, there's no more capacity in their balance sheet. And that's when all this stuff comes crashing down. If you want to look at how systemic inflation is, this is a piece that was done on the cost of building a home. And so we all know the lumber story up almost 300%. We know the steel story with industrial and commercial construction. But look at some of these other items. Look at paint year over year. Paint just to clean up and renovate your house or paint the sheetrock in a tenant move. It's up almost 70%. Look at appliances, over 65%. We have embedded inflation in everything and now it's moving into wage inflation. And so that's when you get in trouble and the perception and expectations are that everything's gonna be higher. That's when the Fed loses control. That's when we have that once in every two generation event like we had in the 1970s. And so I think this is the thing that we're gonna be wrestling with the second half of the year and into next year. Also another source I'll give you to track this in your particular region is ENR, Engineering News Record, produces a construction nomic section and they break out construction costs versus building costs. They have a, a city index um, that they look at. Seattle is one of the markets that's in the city index area. So you can translate this type of construction inflation local. And why I think this is gonna be important, you might be saying, well, I'm, I'm a broker, I don't deal with new construction, new development. I just deal with helping tenants move from one location to another. Well, think of the cost of tenant renovation. 
if you got a tenant that's going to move and they need to move walls and they need metal studs and they need sheetrock and they need paint, guess what? It's in short supply and it's going to cost double what you thought. So um, when you're looking at advising a client on a tenant move, if there's any way they can put that off 12 months and do a, a short-term extension and then look at the move a year down the road, you might find that you can save them 20 to 50% on the cost of those TIs. And that's a unique value that you as CCIMs can bring to your existing tenants that are looking at moves or you do a lot of leasing activity. Um, so the last thing I wanna talk about is we started in 2018 uh, really awakening the world to adaptive reuse with our first, um, actually it was our second paper on adaptive reuse. The first one was um, turning, uh, turning blight bright. Well, we just completed a new paper um, with a grant from the National Association of Realtors and the Florida Realtors on adaptive reuse 2.0. And we call it making bright brighter. And what this really means is we're seeing adaptive reuse evolve from single asset conversions to looking at a whole neighborhood. You have a suburban mall that's gone dead. It affects a whole neighborhood. The housing neighborhood is very bright, good demographics, good household values, but you got this, this big whole neighborhood in the middle that you got to figure out how to deal with the whole animal so that you don't destroy all the bright that's already around it. So this was a really fun paper. We're all part of the National Association of Realtor Community. We're an affiliate. Uh, we did this. We compliment a lot of your CCIMs in Miami. They were great at uh, selecting us to do this paper. Uh, one of your newest CCIMs, Kaylin Peterson, who works with us at Red Shoe Economics, she's going to be sitting for the CCIM exam in October in Pittsburgh. Uh, so she was my co-author and my partner, Beverly Keith. She kept us all on task to get this over the goal line. So it was a really neat effort. Adaptive reuse hasn't gone away. It's now about the neighborhood approach. We talk about other examples in uh, Phoenix, in uh, Tempe, near Arizona State, uh, a mall deal that became a neighborhood adaptive reuse in Denver, known as the Streets of South Glen. Last thing I want to bring to your attention is the Councils of Real Estate will release on June 23rd their annual top 10 real estate issues. And so I'm an MAI, a, a CRE, and a CCIM. I get another designation. I'm going to have to put M-O-U-S-E after my name. I won't put, ever put PhD there. <laughs> I'm too old to go get all the, all the, uh, all the stuff done. But um, I will tell you and leak that two of the top 10 issues are issues that the CCIM Institute has led on. The first is adaptive reuse. It's the first time ever that adaptive reuse has made the top 10 issues in the 15, 20 year history of doing the top 10 issues um, that I was there at the, at the founding of this issue with Scott Muldaven, who really got it going. The second is logistics. We have absolutely owned and led on that topic, whether it's logistics infrastructure, last mile logistics. Remember our ward course that we introduced in, Jan in January was the first industry course on last mile logistics. What is it? How does it work? We're the appraisal institute, the councils of real estate, ULI, NAOP, SR, none of them have had a curriculum on that. We're the first out there. So be very proud of CCIMs that two of these top 10 issues are issues that we have really had leadership on for our entire industry. This releases on June 23rd. Um, really good roots here that tie back to the CCIM Institute. So lastly, I'll close. This is my new company. Many of you know I was a uh, budget casualty at the University of Alabama last fall. So I decided at 58, what was it? What was a good thing to do in the middle of the pandemic? I'd start my first business. So I was fortunate to find a fellow CCIM to help get me going. So if you're going to start your own business, get another CCIM involved with you. Beverly Keith has been a great partner. Uh, we've got this thing going. We've, we've been able to eke out a profit each quarter. We're three quarters old. We're having the best time of our life. We're doing a lot of very different things. Uh, we've kept our roots and things I do strong, adaptive reuse, logistics, uh, a lot of litigation support that I do. So this is a little bit about who we are. There's Kaylin Peterson. Uh, we'll have a CCIM after that, we hope, uh, in October here. Um, and so uh, I'm in Atlanta. Beverly's here in North Carolina. We go back and forth. But we really are proud to be affiliated with the CCIM Institute. I'm really thrilled to be your chief economist. And hopefully we provided some nuggets and unique things about your part of the country and some bigger issues. So. With that, I'll, I'll stop. I can stop sharing and we'll see if there's any, uh, any questions. Throw it back to you. Well, thank you, Casey. That was absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. Um, there are a couple questions that we have here. I, I thought we'd kick it off with uh, kind of the more dour thing and then maybe go to something a little bit uh, more fun. You had mentioned that, you know, the Fed has their open market committee meeting today and that we're seeing inflation. It seems like uh, Chairman Powell is comfortable letting 
inflation run above our 2% target because we've been below it for a long period of time. And they keep saying that it is transitory, which if I understand that correctly, means our supply chains are kind of mucked up and we'll straighten those out. What's your take on the ramifications of some of that? Is that reasonable? Um, just expound upon what that might mean. Yeah, the Fed always gets it wrong. Uh, you look at when they should raise rates, when they should cut rates, they never get it right. And I spent five years there and I understand how the sausage is made. Um, I really think they have it wrong here. Um, when you're looking at the kind of GDP growth, you look at any metric, whether it's GDP growth, look at the JOLT survey and the number of open jobs that can't be filled. 8.1 million open jobs right now and we can't get people back to work. Uh, when you look at driving around your own neighborhoods, I've been you know, finally starting to travel. It doesn't matter where I go. Uh, you can't go about a mile without seeing a help wanted sign. And I'm not talking about restaurants or hotels. I'm talking about small businesses, medium-sized business, manufacturing, Amazon, FedEx. I'll give you another example. I recently spoke to the Arkansas CCM chapter. Guess what the state of Arkansas is doing to try to get the labor in that its industry needs? They're offering 10 thousand dollar one-time grants to relocate to Arkansas for a permanent job. And as long as you work for 18 months, it's forgiven completely. Um, this doesn't, this isn't transitory. This is systemic. Um, chips, one of the things in our supply chain that's affecting everything that we own is chips. Well, we've been adding technology and the need for chips into everything. And it's not just been cars, but I'll give cars an example. Anybody want to speculate on how many chips go into a new car today? It's 1,400. Automotive News just published a thing, 1,400 chips. And the reason there's so many, they don't use a central chip control center in the car because they don't know what option somebody's going to put on there. So they leach, each option is a new one to five chips that go in for, did you get the Sirius satellite radio or did you get just the sensors in the bumper versus the backup camera? Every one of those are new chips. I just renovated my home and we had a hard time with appliances. So we finally bought uh, you know, the appliances uh, off the model display rather than waiting six months. And I was reading in the manual, how many chips are in our new stove system that we put into the kitchen? There are 85 chips in the doggone stove. Every kind of sensor tied to your phone app, the garage door openers have chips in them to tie to your, uh, you know, your phone and your systems in your car. We haven't built 10% of the chip capacity that we need today over the last 20 years. And the ones that we have been building have been in parts of the world that are hostile to us. So we, it's not gonna, we're not gonna solve this chip shortage problem tomorrow. Ford's gonna continue to have probably 40,000 F-150 trucks parked, unable to deliver because they can't get chips. So this is a multi-year process just to fix that. And that goes into light fixtures, appliances, cars, um, and then look at raw commodities. So there's such a, you, you, when you shut, when you have a just-in-time economy from the 1980s, just-in-time inventory, and you shut it down for a year, you screw things up for a long damn time. <laughs> it's like you take your kid out of school for a year. It takes probably years to get them back on track for that full year that they lost. So I think we're in a real, real serious problem and that we have inflation everywhere. Uh, it's not just houses, it's not just cars, and the Fed is fueling it and they're trying to disguise it um, in different means. So people ask me, what is this like? So I know it's a long, long answer, but I think this is important. So people ask me, Casey, is there anything like this in our prior history we can point to? I hinted to it a little earlier. This is 1977 to 1981, all over if the Fed can't get it right. So think of what happened. We went in the 1960s, went into deficit spending for the Vietnam War. Nixon came into power in 68 and the Vietnam War, he saw inflation and what did he do? He put price controls in effect. The price controls just tempered it down. Then what did we have? We had an oil embargo with OPEC and energy prices went from 25 cents a gallon to over a dollar a gallon like that. And we had gas lines. You can't fix that right away. <laughs> and so then we have a political crisis, right? Watergate. So we all get distracted. And uh, then we have Ford try to heal America. Jimmy Carter comes in. The only subject he didn't take in submarine command school was economics. He had no clue what to do with all of this hitting at once. So it was energy that caused the inflation then. I think today it's bad monetary and fiscal policy. We don't have dry powder. We can't deal with this stuff. We can't buy our way out of this quick enough. And we have a more interconnected global economy that also wants to grow and do its own thing. So I think we have 
really serious systemic inflation. We are already in less than six months have gone to 6% inflation, which is what it averaged 77 to 81. That scares the bleep out of me. And that's what I think we're gonna have to worry about. For us in our industry, that's great. Commercial prices go up. People can't build new stuff. So existing assets become more valuable. We have to think about being a better counselor to our tenants and our, our clients that have tenants that are moving around because they may not realize they can't afford the cost of a, of a better rent deal is made up for in the cost to do the renovation. So I am really worried. It's my number one concern. I have no confidence in the Fed right now. And I think they're going to take us over the cliff and that by the time they get, they're going to go to just pulling back asset purchases, that's going to be too late. And they really should have been hiking rates. And they're going to choke on these words about no rate hikes until 2023. We will see rate hikes next year. So sorry for that bad news, but you know, it's good. Like it's good generally for our industry. Prices go up. We do different types of transactions, but we need to be a good counsel advisor to our to our clients. That's where we add value because we connect these dots and we tell the truth. Interesting. So we have one more that's on the inflation thread that I, I think would be really good for the group. Um, this is from Craig Finrock. Will the high inflation we're seeing now kill the red hot housing market? I don't think so. So again, go back to the 1970s, right? It didn't kill the housing market. It actually fueled it because if you go back, what you remember is back then, most mortgages had an assumable feature. And so you'd sell your house subject to assuming the mortgage. And part of the home price was the value of the mortgage you were assuming. You buy a, you could assume a 6% mortgage and then pay the cash difference or finance the cash difference. And as an appraiser, we had to do this thing called cash equivalency adjustments to deal with that. Those are gone. We should be doing those now with these, you know, three and a half percent mortgages. So we find creative ways in housing finance. The government controls FHFA. How did they respond in COVID to keep us from having a housing crisis? They created rent uh, mortgage uh, forbearance, uh, rent, mor rent forbearance, mortgage forbearance. And then the Fed went in and said, all those mortgages that FHA doesn't have capital for that it needs to offload to make room for new mortgages that are delinquent. <laughs> um, what they did is they said, we'll go from holding 600 billion of those to over $2 trillion. That's why we didn't have a housing crisis. All these intervention measures, and I think what we'll have is the Fed has realized from the 2009 housing crisis, they will, they will stop anywhere they need to accept housing and they will do whatever it takes um, they are so afraid of another housing crisis that they will create new financing products. We'll go back to no money down. We'll go back to all kinds of crazy finance mechanisms to keep it going. We're going to see companies, instead of offering relocation bonuses like Arkansas, we'll see Arkansas offer uh, down payment assistance to move to their state and buy out. We're going to see a whole slew of new mortgage products. It could be could dwarf what we saw before the housing crisis in mortgage and subprime mortgage financing, but I don't think it'll kill it. We are creating households, millennials that were not able to find a job post the financial crisis, went and got more skills. They went to grad school. They're now in high demand. They're now getting jobs. They can work anywhere. Um, I don't think it'll kill the housing. I think what it means is we have one hell of a housing affordability crisis that's ahead of us. And I see, don't, I see no easy fixes for that. 